Hi. Now it's time to take a look at actually evaluating a, a function of a complex variable. Now the definition of a, of a complex integral, or as we'll call them from now on, contour integrals, is as we, we showed on the very first video, uh, we take the limit of a, a bunch of sums, uh, and the sums are evaluated at, by, uh, by taking points along a complex curve and multiplying by a difference in the endpoints, which depends on the partition. We'd like to see if we can come up with a more useful definition. Uh, or rather a more useful form for computing the integral rather than having to go to the definition every time. Now if we uh, write the definition in a slightly different way, we can take the, uh, the function value and break it up into its real and imaginary parts. And if we evaluate those at a certain bunch of places and we rewrite this delta zk as a delta x plus an i delta y, and if we then take the limit as the partition uh, gets finer and finer, we'll uh, see that we turn uh, our original definition into something that looks like this. We'll have an integral of u dx uh, minus v dy plus i times another integral that looks like that. Now these are very similar to just line integrals uh, like the kind we saw in third semester calculus. But there's an even better way of doing this. Recall that when we looked at uh, real line integrals, what we did was parameterize the path and then use the parameterized versions to, uh, to transform the insides of the integrals and evaluate the, uh, the integrals in the end. We're going to do something very similar here. If we were to sort of insert a parameterization in at this step and uh, continue on a few steps further, we'd arrive at another form, which is the form we will use um, for our problems. The theorem is that if you want to integrate a function in the complex plane along the curve C, what you ought to do is uh, parameterize your curve C, and then uh, stick Z, uh, the parameterized version of Z into the function, and then replace DZ by this Z prime of T dt. And then if you integrate along the, uh, the values that T takes on, you will get the same value as the, um, the definite integral, assuming that F is a continuous function on a smooth curve C. Now, before we jump into some examples, let's talk about some properties. There shouldn't be anything really surprising about these properties. All we're saying is that if we uh, have some nice functions, um, then the integral of the sum of two functions is going to be the sum of the two integrals. We can take a constant factor and pull it outside of the integral. And if we have our, our path of integration made up of two uh, separate curves that glued together form the path overall, then the uh, the integral along the entire path is just the sum of the integrals along the pieces. And finally, here's where orientation becomes important. If you integrate along a curve in the opposite direction from the way you started, you'll get the opposite result of what you would if you integrated along the curve in the normal direction. All right, let's, uh, let's take a look at our specific example. Let's suppose that C is the path that starts at the point minus one plus i travels along a straight line to the origin, zero, and then travels along a straight line to the point one plus i, and we want to integrate the function e of z along this path. Well, we'll uh, start by um, breaking our path up into two line segments. We'll call the first one c1, we'll call the second one c2, and we'll assume the, uh, the directions are as, uh, as they were in the original path, and we'll find the integral over the entire path by taking the integral along each of the two paths individually and then adding the results together. Now, to, uh, to do that, we're going to parameterize our paths C1 and C2, and then we're going to uh, use this theorem from the previous slide. So let's start with C1. We're dealing with a line segment from minus one plus i down to zero. We can parameterize that by taking minus one plus i and then adding t times one minus i, where t ranges from zero to one. Now if we feed this uh, parameterization into the integral, we're going to uh, put e to the z, right? That is e raised to the, uh, the z of t. And then we're gonna replace dz by z prime of t dt. And we end up with this expression there. Now the thing to do here is recall the definition. e to the z uh, was defined in terms of uh, the real and imaginary parts. So if we take the ex exponent there and we separate it into real and imaginary parts and we substitute it into our definition of e to the z, uh, we'll have an expression that looks like this. And we can now put this into our 
our integral. Now in the previous video we talked about integrals of this form. You'll notice we've got a single real variable and we've got a function that has a real and an imaginary part. Now to clean that up I'm going to actually times the 1 minus i through the first set of parentheses and then split the integral up. Uh, in one integral will have the real part of the function and then we'll have i times the second integral which contains the imaginary part of the function. Now at this point things are looking quite a bit messy um, but at this point we can now use our, our techniques from first or second semester calculus. These are actually real integrals. We'll find them by using the fundamental theorem of calculus. We'll find an antiderivative and, uh, and proceed from there. Now that's easier said than done of course. Um, we're going to uh, use a couple of integral formulas. e to the x cosine of x that has an antiderivative that we can look up and so does e to the x sine of x. So if we use these formulas and we uh, go very carefully and patiently through this, we'll end up at the very end uh, concluding that the path uh, uh, C1 uh, gives us a value of 1 minus e to the minus 1 cosine of 1 minus i e to the minus 1 sine of 1 um, as we integrate along it. Now doing something very similar uh, along the path C2, skipping the details and going right to the end, we'll get a, a similar value for the second half of the integral. When we add these two together, we get the total value of the integral of e to, e, of z, e to the z along the path c. And uh, so that's the process. Now, as you're looking at that, that was kind of a long process, uh, kind of tedious. And as you take a look at the result, you'll notice that, hey, this actually looks a lot like e to the 1 plus i minus e to the minus 1 plus i. And you may notice that, hey, these were the endpoints of my path. And e to the z, w couldn't I just take an antiderivative and plug the endpoints in and get the same thing? So we're starting to wonder, maybe uh, maybe there's a fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, now we don't know that that's actually true. We won't know that for a couple sections. So please, uh, for the sake of appreciating the, the beauty of these theorems later, please uh, follow the process. Remember the key thing to do will be to parameterize your path and then to use this simplifying theorem uh, to evaluate your integrals. All right, in the next video we'll take a look at another example. See you then.